is tin. Tin. T I N. Tin. It's a metal. So see it on the periodic table. See S N number 50? Mm -hmm. So S N is tin, but that's not one of those that you would have to know, so I wouldn't ask you that one. I wouldn't ask you to tell me what it is, but you can tell it's an element because it's on the periodic table. Then over on the right side, SNCl4. So from this formula, I have one SN and I have four chlorines. So everybody understands how you got those numbers. So they're just based on the formula on each side. So SN all by itself means there's only one SN. Cl2, two chlorines. Product side SNCl4 means there's one SN and four chlorines. So now you got to do the comparison. Notice that SN is already balanced. I've already got one and one, so I don't have to do anything to that. But then looking at the chlorine, which side am I going to have to change? The left. Do you see that there's two chlorines on the left, four chlorines on the right? So I have to increase the lower number. What do I have to multiply that by to have four? Two. So that two... The two, whatever you're going to multiply by goes on the top, and that's going to multiply the number of chlorines by two, giving me a total of four chlorines. So the number on the line multiplies the number of each element behind it, okay? The entire molecule, not just one of them. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. So whatever's on this side, we got to make sure it's on Yep, the total number of chlorines, the total number of tin on both sides has to be the same. And that's why you add those coefficients, okay? I can't change the formula. The formula, the way the equation is written, is the way the equation is written. But I can add those coefficients, the numbers on the line in front, to change the total number of tin and chlorine so that it's balanced. So do I have to change anything else? Nope, okay? One in one tin, one tin, four chlorine, four chlorine. So remember, if you don't put anything, it's just a one. So it doesn't, you don't have to put something on the line, but if you end up being done and it's balanced and there's it's blank, just remember that means that that would be a one. Because for some reason I've had some students think that meant it was a zero, but that actually meant all I needed is one tin plus two chlorines would make one tin chloride. Okay, so next one, going down, draw the line. How many iron? One, so one Fe, how many oxygen? Two, mm -hmm. because see it's O2. Then over on product side, how many iron? Two. And how many oxygen? Three. So everybody's got how to do that, how to, how to like figure that out. Now you do the comparison. See that none of them are balanced, okay? So you get to pick. These were only found in one place on either side, so I call them like the simple ones. So you can pick. It's not, you don't have to do one or the other first. Which one would you like to, to balance first? Okay, so let's balance the iron first. So which side do I need to change? The left. What do I have to put on the line? A two, because that's going to multiply the number of irons by two. It's going to give me two Fe. Now. Irons are balanced, I gotta balance oxygen. So on the left side, I have two oxygen. On the right side, I have three. What is the smallest number they both go into? Six, okay? So the only way to make them balance is I'm gonna have to make them both six oxygens on either side. The only way to balance is to make them both six. So what am I gonna have to do to the left side? Put a three. Mm -hmm. So if I have a three times three, that's going to give me six oxygen. And then what am I going to have to do to the other side? Put a two. But now notice when I put a two, it's going to double the iron and the oxygen. Does everybody see that? That's going to give me four iron and it's going to give me six oxygen. So this usually really bothers people because they're like, well, you balanced the oxygen, but now you messed up the iron. That's okay. What do I have to do now? I have one more step. Mm -hmm. So I've got to go back and fix the iron over on the left side so that I can get it balanced. So right now I only have two iron. So what do I have to multiply this by to have a total of four? So I'm going to have to say times two times two, which then gives me four iron. Now, do I have four iron, four iron? Yes. Do I have six oxygen, six oxygen total? Yes. So this is balanced. But now what do I have to change that? number in front of the Fe. Two times two, just place, tell what it is. So that means it's a four. Okay. I had to multiply it by two, but then I had to go back and multiply it by two again.
Okay. So I want you to practice these. Remember that in your unit conversion handout, that's the handout with the unit conversions. The second page is all balancing equations. I can show you here, maybe. I can show you, I think it's in here. I don't see it here. Maybe I, do I have it? Maybe I have to post it. I'll, need, I'll post tonight. I will post the, oh, it hits right here. I was like, why am I not seeing it? See the folder? See the second blue? It says balancing equations and unit conversion worksheets and answer keys. Okay, so if you go to this, it will actually show you, here's the balancing equation key. So that'll show you like the right answers for balancing equations for that handout. So practice the handout and then you can check yourself so that you can see, have I really got this? Have I got this like, like being able to go back and forth, back and forth. You have the blank handout, but there's the answer keys right there. And then what we're going to do tonight are unit conversions. And so there's the answer keys for that, for the, that other two pages of that handout. All right. So we were talking about math and metric. Right. So remember in metric, the nice thing about metric is you start with a base unit and all prefixes do is indicate a number that's bigger or smaller than that base unit. So the ones that we talked about last time is we talked about kilo, deci, centi, milli and micro. So those are really the only five that you need to remember. Kilo, deci, centi, milli and micro. So for this class, and in fact, for almost all of your medical use, these are really the five that come up and need to maybe need to be converted at times. Kilo, remember, is a thousand times larger. So kilo of anything is a thousand times larger than the base unit. So notice one kilogram, I'd have to have a thousand grams. One kilometer, a thousand meters. One kiloliter, a thousand liters. So notice in that one, the prefix unit gets the one and the base unit is the thousand. And that's because kilo is so much bigger. All of these other ones are smaller. Deci, 10 times smaller. It takes 10 deci to make a base unit. So 10 decigrams makes a gram. 10 deciliters makes a liter. Centi is a hundred. So anytime you have a unit conversion with centi, you're always going to put 100 in front of the centi prefix. So it doesn't matter if it's grams, meters, or liters. You can do it with mass, volume, or length. You just use that prefix for either or any of those three combinations, which is really nice. Because you know in English, if you're talking about length, you have like a foot. Then you have to remember inches and how many inches in a foot. And then you have to remember yards and how many feet in a yard. And then you got to remember how many yards in a mile. So you've got like all those different units and they're all different in terms of size. With metric, everything's just different by powers of 10. So I don't have to remember those numbers. I really just end up moving my decimal place from one direction to another to be able to change from one to the other. So if you see deci in a unit conversion, deci always gets a 10. If you see centi, centi always gets a hundred. Milli will always get the thousand. Micro will always get a million. So if I want to put a relationship or a conversion factor comparing decigrams and grams, I say that 10 decigrams is equal to one gram. So that means that I could put them one over the other, or I could flip it the other direction. So I could have one gram over 10 decigrams or 10 decigrams over one gram, either one. And it's very much like saying 12 eggs over one dozen. You agree those are both the same. So that's the same here. So I could have, if I had 100 centimeters over one meter, because centi is 100, takes 100 centi to make a base unit. So these are equal. They're equal, they're just talking about different size units. So in dimensional analysis or doing these unit conversions, if one of your units is the base unit, so if you have, like in my example, I have liters. Liters is one of my units that I want to convert to. So because I have milliliters and liters, I know how milli relates to the base unit. Milli is always a thousand. So I can do this in just one step. You always write down the unit you're given first, times in the line. Then you put the unit you're given on the bottom, 
the unit you want to go to goes on top. Then you add what those number values are, so they're equivalents. In this one, I had to put a thousand in front of milli, liter gets the one, doing the math, pretty straightforward. So here's this one. So what if I have 24 milliliters and I wanna know how many liters this is? So 24 ml is equal to how many liters? Here's the step. Because I have liters in this one, I can do this in what I call just a single step. So what's the unit that I'm given? What do I know? 24 milliliters. So what you're given, what you know goes down first, times and a line. Now I wanna get rid of milliliters, so I'm gonna put that on the bottom. So milliliters, the unit you're given always goes on the bottom in the first step. And the unit that I wanna go to is the answer, which would be liters. Whenever you see milli, what goes in front of it? A thousand. Milli gets a thousand, liters gets the one. So see how then milli and milli will cancel and now I just have to do the math. So in doing this, it's 24 times one, because that's across the top. And remember, anything times one, nothing changes. So you just, you can kind of like ignore when you see times one. So 24 divided by a thousand. Mm -hmm. 0 0.024. Decimal place goes to the left by the number of zeros. You'll always have a calculator if you need to run up here and grab a calculator if you didn't bring one with you. You've got calculators. I'll always have them. For you guys, there will always be enough calculators so that you'll have them to use during an exam. So if you have your own calculator, I encourage you to bring it to class to use. But if you don't, I'll always have the calculators down here in the box and the lid will be open. So when you walk in, grab a pair out of table, grab a calculator, and that way you're ready. Okay. I mean, I won't put them out if I know we're not doing any math, but if we're doing any math, if you see the box open, then you probably open to grab one if you don't have one. Okay. So this I call one step because liters is one of my units. Same thing with the next one. In the next one, grams is one of my units. And so I know I can do this in a single step. So what is my given unit? 97.1. And it is just G times in a line, just like before. What unit am I going to put at the bottom? Grams. What unit am I going to put on top? Kilograms. Kilograms. Whenever I see kilo, kilo gets a... Mm -mm. Remember, kilo. Kilo is the one unit that is bigger. It's like trying to measure a, a mile versus a yard. Kilo is big. The bigger unit gets the one. So kilo gets a one. And grams gets the thousand. So see how that's different from milliliters. Milli is smaller. So milli, it takes a thousand milli to bank a base unit. But kilo is a big unit size. Kilo gets the one and it takes a thousand base units to make the kilo. Okay, so note to yourself, you've got to remember the bigger unit gets the one. Deci, centi, milli, micro, they're all smaller. The kilo is bigger. That is why kilo gets the one, and it takes a thousand base units to make a kilo of anything. Because I always think, I think of like a yard versus a mile. You agree a mile is a much bigger unit? Well, a kilometer is about a half a mile. So it's a much larger size that is why kilo being larger gets the one. And that means the base unit gets this, the thousand. So now, again, canceling and canceling. So I'm gonna take 97.1 and divide it by a thousand. So you get mm -hmm, 0.0971. So the one you ignore, it's 97.1 divided by everything in the bottom. So that would be divided by a thousand. Mm -hmm. And is it because you have two Gs, you cancel them out? The two, mm -hmm, that's why you set it up this way. The unit you're given always goes on the bottom in the first step. The unit you want to get to goes on the top if it's on a one step only. So try this one. So remember this U, that is mm -hmm, micro, which is the mu symbol. So that funny looking little U is the micro. 
It's a little micro symbol. So see if you can set it up. Mm -hmm. But set it up where it needs to go. So like I said, each time, write down what you're given, times in a line. Put the unit you're given on the bottom. Put the unit you want on the top. Then put the numbers in. Don't try to put the numbers in before you do the units because that's when I see students flip them. Like accidentally just go like, oh yeah, I'm going to put this here. Put the units down first, then put fill in with the numbers. So what unit did you put on the bottom? Micrometers. Mm -hmm. So the unit you just had goes on the bottom, just like all the other ones. Mm -hmm. So first, before you put a number, what's the unit that goes on top? M. Okay, so they answer. So put the two units first. Now go back and put the numbers. Anytime you see micro, what goes in front of it? A million, right? So micro gets the million. That's a one with six zeros. The base unit gets the one because micro is really, really, really small. It takes a million micro just to make a base unit. So is it always going to be a one? One of them will be a one. The other one's going to be some number. Okay. For deci, centi, million, micro, those ones will always have 10, 100, 1,000, or a million. For kilo, kilo will be the one and the base unit's a thousand. Huh? You don't always divide. So you multiply everything across the top and divide by each thing on the bottom. Okay? Nope. Mm -mm. So you don't know the numbers until you put the units, which is why I say put the units first. Okay? Because the units tells you what goes there. Okay? Right. You don't know. Well, so in these cases, yes, all of them have a one at the top, but that is not the case always. We're going to do a couple more so you'll see that. Okay. So what I would say, you put your unit, times in the line, always put the unit you're given on the bottom, put the unit that you want to go to if it's a single step goes on top, then assign the units or what the number values mean. So in this, once I get these set, it'd be 125,000 divided by a million comes out as Mm -hmm. 0 0.125. So what about 48 met meters is how many micrometers? So you do this one then, because you want to see one that doesn't have the zero, that doesn't have a one at the top. So here's this one. So here I'm doing it, I've got 48 meters, and I want to know how many micrometers that is. What do I know? What do I start with? Okay. 48 what? Meters times in a line. What unit do I put on the bottom? What unit goes on top? Micrometers. Okay? So always put your units first. Now, anytime you see micro, where do, what you put in front? A million. So notice here, micro, the million is on top. What unit do I put on the bottom? The one. So meters and meters will still cancel. But now when I do this math, what am I going to do? 48 times a million. So this is going to be 48 million in my answer. So do you see? I would just multiply everything across the top and divide by one, which isn't going to change my number. So this one... Would be 48, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and that's micrometers. Okay, so the number you put depends on what the units are. Notice that liters, grams, meters, those are units in the problem for these. And when you have that, you can do this in what I call a single step. But what if I have millimeters? In centimeters, what if I have two prefixed units? So that is this. If both units have prefixes, and so can you see in this one, do you notice that decigram and milligram, 
Do you see that both of those are prefixed units? So I know how decigram connects to the base unit, and I understand how milli connects to the base unit, but I don't have a relationship between these two. But I can take deci, go to a base unit, and then from the base unit, go to milli. Doesn't matter what my base unit is. I can do this in two steps. So from decigrams, you're going to convert this to gram. And then from gram, you can go to milligram. So we're just going to set it up in two steps. And if you do it this way, you don't have to remember anything other than those five basic unit conversion numbers. You just have to remember that kilo is a thousand times larger. Kilo gets a one. Base unit gets a thousand. Deci is 10 times smaller. It gets a 10. Centi is a hundred times smaller. It gets a hundred. Milli is a thousand times smaller, gets a million, and then that micro is a million times larger. I mean, it's smaller, so it gets the million. So in this one, this is like one step, and this is the second step. So I always start off with what I'm given. Well, that's a strange line. So I have four DG, and then times and a line. What goes on the bottom in the first step? DG. The unit you start with always goes on the bottom in the first step. Okay, so everybody got that? So for DG, that decigrams goes on the bottom in the first step. And I want to go to what? Grams. grams. So in this first step number one, I want to do a decigrams to grams ratio. Whenever I see deci, what goes in front of it? Yeah. 10. Grams gets the one. So I did that first step. So now let's do the second step. So here's step number two times in a line. Now what do I put on the bottom? Grams, because now I want to get rid of grams because I want to go to my answer, which is milligrams. When I see milli, what do you put? A thousand. A thousand. Mm -hmm. So do you see that decigrams and decigrams will cancel? Grams and grams will cancel. So your answer is going to be in milligrams. So this is in the top. This is in the denominator. This is in the top. This is in the denominator. So those will cancel each other out. And it's going to leave you with the unit you want, which is milligrams. So now the last question is, well, how do you solve this? What do I have to do? You take four times a thousand divided by ten. So look at that. Everything across the top divided by each thing in the bottom. Because mm -hmm. you could think of it, it's kind of like this. That's one, like, that's all in the denominator. The four times one times a thousand, that's all in the denominator. So you multiply all those. And then anything in the denominator, you just go divided by. Okay? So it ends up 4,000 divided by 10. So that ends up being what? 400. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Four times a thousand would be four thousand divided by ten would be four hundred. Okay, so here's a kiloliter to deciliter. So this one we're going from a really big unit to a really small unit. So twenty-four kiloliters times in a line. What am I going to put on the bottom in this one? Kl. KL. Mm -hmm. So kiloliters will go on the bottom. What am I going to have to put on top? I can't go to deciliter directly because see how they both are prefixes? Kilo is a prefix. Deci is a prefix. So I need to go KL to L and then to DL. I want to do that in two steps. See how that's different than the previous page? The previous page I had like liter or I had grams or I had meter as one of my units. Here, I have two prefix units and I'm just going to always go to the base unit first. So liter goes here. So when I see kilo, kilo always gets a one. one. Yep. Liter then gets the thousand. It takes a thousand liters to make a kiloliter. Now I gotta do the second step. So in the second step, what do I put on the bottom? Liter. 
Hmm? So the unit I had in the first step on top goes in the bottom on the second step, and then I can put my answer. So the answer is deciliter. Mm -hmm. Anytime you see deci, what do you put in front of it? 10 and a 1. So how do I do this math? You just multiply them all, right? So it's 24 times 1,000 times 10. Because divided by 1 divided by 1 does nothing. doesn't change your number. It should be 240,000 deciliters. I went from a really big measurement to a really small measurement, so there's a whole lot of them. See if you can set this last one up. This last one's going from really tiny measurements to small measurements. 97,123 micrograms. Convert that to centigrams. So 97, 123 micrograms times in a line. Where are you going to go first? Micrograms on the bottom and grams on the top. When you see micro, what does it get? A million. And a one on top of grams. Mm -hmm. So one's going to have another a number. The other one's going to be a one, right? Because we're saying how they're equal. Okay, but I'm not done. So what goes on the bottom now? Grams. And what goes on the top? Centigrams. Mm -hmm. When you see centi? A hundred, like a century. Mm -hmm. And that means that grams gets the one. So in the first unit conversion, I have a big number on the bottom. In the second unit conversion, I have a big number on the top. The number depends on where the units are. So that's why it's important to make sure you put the units there, then assign the number value to them. Micrograms and micrograms cancel. Grams and grams will cancel. So how do I do this math? Mm -hmm. So 97,123 times 100 and then divide by a million. Mm -hmm. So just go and multiply everything across the top and then just divide by each thing in the bottom. What'd you get? Mm -hmm. So you got... Six. Oh, yes, I did, honey. I left off a zero. <laughs> In the million? That happens. I can't tell you how often that happens is people put a hundred thousand. So that's why I'm like, when you put it in your calculator, I always go one, two, three, four, five, six. Like I literally count six zeros. If you're, if you, yes. So like, and this is, I'm not, I'm doing it in my head because I can take and move my decimal place two places to the right and then move my decimal place six places back over to the left. So if you're comfortable just moving the decimal places, yes, because all it's doing is changing where the decimal position. And that's the nice thing. I don't have to remember the 12, the three, the 16 ounces in a pound. I don't have to remember those numbers. Everything really is just a matter of changing by size with the decimal. Okay, so practice those ones. Practice those because we're going to use this all semester. And you're going to see this when medications, weights, dosages, all of this comes into play. You may need to be able to do a unit conversion because you can't multiply milligrams times centigrams. 
That's like trying to multiply feet times inches. You have to put them on the same value so that units will cancel. So here's an example. The doctor orders 0.25 milligrams of digoxin. So digoxin is a common heart med that's given after a patient has a heart attack. It helps to slow and steady heart rate. So I know, and I always like to put down things I know, so I have 0.25 milligrams of this medication. I don't really care what the med is, but I know what it, what the concentration, that's really what, I, or the amount. And I have a solution. If you have a solution, what does that mean? Anything in a solution is going to have volume. It's a liquid, okay? So if I have a solution, then that means this medicine is in some kind of liquid. It might be in something that's an injection. It might be in a liquid that you might have to drink. It might be in a liquid that you have to add to an IV solution. So those are all possibilities. When they say I have a solution, remember that that means that I have medicine in a liquid. So the solution means that I have 500 micrograms of medication in one milliliter of the solution. So I have a bottle of it and that's its concentration. So they would say it's 500 micrograms per mil. That's how much medicine is in each mil So if I want to know how much I want to give, since it's a liquid, I'm going to give a volume. So I'm going to have to give this patient some volume of this medicine. So I want to try and cancel out my grams. I want to set it up so that the grams will cancel, whether they're milligrams or micrograms. I want them to cancel, and it'll tell me how much of this medicine in the liquid that I'm going to give them. But Notice one is milligrams and one is micrograms. So I cannot use, I can't just multiply those because they won't cancel. So I need to put my mass of medication in the same unit value. I personally would change the 0.25 milligrams because it's all by itself. So I would convert, so I'm gonna convert 0 0.25 milligrams equals how many micrograms. Am I going to do this in one step or two? Two, because I have micrograms and milligrams. I have two prefix units, so just go to grams first. So remember that this is going to be a two step. I'm going to go from milligrams to grams and grams to micrograms. So in doing that conversion, 0 0.25 milligrams times in the line, milligrams on the bottom, grams on top. Milli always gets a thousand, so a thousand's on the bottom, one for the gram, then times in one more line. Now grams goes on the bottom, so they'll cancel. Micrograms goes on top, micro gets the million, grams gets the one. So milligrams and milligrams, grams and grams, those will all cancel. Doing the math for this, 0.25 times a million divided by a thousand. So you got 250. So now I know 250 micrograms is what I need to give. That's how much of this medicine I have to give this patient. And it comes in a liquid where there's 500 micrograms in a mil. So, I can use that concentration, the solution. Oh, hmm? oh, that wasn't the I had to do this conversion so that I could put my two masses the same, right? So I had to figure out how many micrograms 0.25 milligrams is. So I have one more step. So I had to make sure that my units were the same so they'll cancel. I wanna use this 
Which of those units can I put on the bottom to make micrograms cancel? Mm -hmm. So if I put 500 micrograms on the bottom, what can I put on the top? Milliliters, and it would be a one. If there's no number, you know that means that there's just one. Do you see that now these mass amounts will cancel? And that's going to tell you how much of this medicine you give the patient. So how do you do this math? Mm -hmm. Divide by, mm -hmm. comes out as 0.5. So this one, med times concentration, you just need to make sure that that concentration, those units will cancel. This is a common medication dosage calculation. Keeping your units can help you see it, okay? So, so that you know that, oh, I gotta divide this, not multiply them. Putting it down and looking at your units can help you keep track of it. We'll do more of these over the first couple of weeks just to hopefully so you see a little more about some of the unit conversions and how they're used in dosages. But we have to talk about something that's really not taught in general math anymore because it's really used when you're talking about measurements and it guides how your answers need to be written. So they call it significant figures. In chemistry, we measure stuff. Okay, so tonight, like you're going to measure like volume, you're going to measure length, you're going to measure mass. So you measure things using instruments like a graduated cylinder or a balance or even just a ruler to measure things. But that means that I'm going to have a measured number. Those measured numbers play into how you round answers when you do multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. So those numbers that we measure are called significant figures. So significant figures, by definition, they are all of your measured values plus that one number that's uncertain. So if I said that there's like 12.5 grams, then that means that I know it's 12 and the 5 might be like 5-1 or might be like 4-9, but the 5 is usually the last digit is has a little bit of uncertainty in it. So that would have three significant figures. The 1, the 2, and the 5. So these are all considered measured values. All numbers that are from 1 to 9 are always significant. So it doesn't matter if I have $1,234,567, all of those would be considered significant. Any number from zero to nine. So really, it's only the zeros. Any number from one to nine, I hope it didn't say zero. Any number from one to nine is considered significant in your measured numbers. It's only zeros that cause problems because zeros sometimes just tell you the size of the number. Sometimes they just hold the decimal place. Sometimes they just indicate a relative size, but they're not actually a measured number. So for example, if I have, I have a container of pennies and I say, I think I have a, a million pennies here. Do I have exactly a million pennies? Aren't you just kind of like estimating? I have so many pennies, I think I have a million. Okay, but that is really not an exact number. That's like an estimate. You might have 999,999, 900, 900, or you might have a million and one. I don't know exactly, so that is more of an estimate. So if I say this, there is only one significant figure in my number, the one all the way out front. If there's no decimal, then those zeros are all just part of an estimation. They're not a measured value. So that's just one significant figure. But what if you sat down and started counting your pennies and you got done and you said, I have one million with a decimal place. I have one million pennies exactly. Now, I'm sure of all those zeros, that's why I put that decimal place at the end. So how many significant figures there? Seven. Seven. 
the one and all six of those zeros. So this would actually be seven significant figures. So zeros are only significant if they are at the end of a number and there's a decimal place somewhere in there. Zeros are also significant if I said, I measured, I counted all my pennies today, and I have one million and one. So that means like I counted them and I got my million and there's one left over. Okay, so those were all measured. I counted all of them. So zeros that are in between non-zero numbers, those are called significant. So that would have how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. So that would have seven significant figures. So zeros in between non-zero numbers. So like if I had, really stop being like this. <laughs> Look, now it's going to start. Yep. I don't even know how I do it sometimes. <laughs> That's how talented I am. <laughs> so if I had one zero one one zero one one. <sighs> Reconnect. Okay. One zero one one zero one one. So how many significant figures would that have? Hold on, it's coming back up. It's up at the top. So up here. Seven. I've just been picking seven randomly tonight, not on purpose, okay? But those zeros in between, those are significant. Any zeros in between non-zero numbers, those are significant. Any zeros at the end of a number that has a decimal, that is significant. So in fact, if I have 0 0.000310, if I have this, how many significant figures in this? There's actually only four. The ones out front, they call them leading zeros. Those zeros are just telling me how big the number is. Just like the million, when you say I got a million pennies, that's just telling you about how many pennies you have. Same thing with those zeros out front. They call them leading zeros. Zeros out front are never significant. But there is a decimal place there. And that's why the ones at the end, that zero down here, that zero is significant. So three, zero, one, zero, the zero in between the three and the one, that's significant because it's in between. The zero at the very end is significant because of the decimal place. So zeros out front, never significant. Zeros at the end, not significant unless there's a decimal place somewhere in the number. Zeros in between, always significant. So let's practice some because that's the only way that you're gonna know if you've got that. You tell me how many significant figures in these numbers. So this is like another PowerPoint slide. Yay, very good. Anybody not know what six? So it's these. The one out front is never significant. The zero in the middle, it is because it's in the middle. What about the next one? Three. Yay. Right? No zero, so the one, the two, and the five. No decimal place, so the zeros at the end are not they're a more estimated number. Four, five, six, one point zero zero two three two five eight. eight. All of them. Mm -hmm. So see that all of them are the zeros are in between. All the others are non-zero numbers. Zero point zero zero two five eight nine six five. Zero point zero zero four five one zero zero five. Mm -hmm. You have five, mm -hmm. right? Those zeros out front are not. What about this one? So this is a million with a decimal place, all of them. So this is seven. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, 95, 9,500.120. Mm -hmm. So now, how do you round these? Because this is going to happen very commonly. You're going to get an answer, and it's going to have way more significant figures than you need. So how do you know how to round? So in this, I'm going to change and go to the green. So if I want to round to three significant figures, here's how you do it. Just start from the left, underline the first whatever significant figures you want. In this case, we're just going to do everything to three. Okay? So in this, there's my first three significant figures from the left. I don't count the zero 
because the zero is not a significant figure. So the one, two, zero. The next number, I'm going to either round up or round down. What am I going to do? Round up. Okay. So my answer is 0 0.121. So that zero rounds up to a one. I keep the zero in front. It's not significant, but it shows where the decimal is. And I keep the decimal. The next one, if I round this to three significant figures, what does this do? Stays exactly the same. Do you see that I would just keep those two zeros at the end? They're not significant, but they show me 12,500. If I didn't put these two, if I left them off, then it would only be 125. So do you see that those two numbers are not similar? If you go and take $12,500 to the bank and they give you back 125, that would be a problem, right? So you got to make sure that you keep zeros at the end or zeros out front just to show the size of the number. So what about this one? First three significant figures are what? Four, five, six. So what's the one going to do? It's going to go away. Okay, so I have four, five, six. Do I just leave it that way? I have to add a zero. Does everybody see why? Because that's 400... 4,561, and I'm going to round it to 4,560 because that keeps the size of the number. It indicates that zero at the end is not significant, but it tells me the size of the number. What are three significant figures that I'm going to use in this next one? Yep, so 258. Next number is a nine, so that's going to round it up. So 0 0.00259. Does that make sense? Okay. What do I get to do to this one? I'm going to keep the four, five, one. The last two are zeros, so what do they do? They go away. Mm -hmm. So 0 0.00451. This one, I won't ask you to do. Same thing with this one. I won't ask you to do these. And the reason is, is like, so see how that's seven? Like I either have seven or I have one like if I drop the decimal place. So in old school math, I would actually keep one, two, three, one, two, three, and then I would put lines. Does anybody remember that? I put like a line over the zeros to show those are significant. I won't ask you to do that, okay? Same thing with that one at the bottom. I would end up having 9,500, but then I put a line over that one zero because that would show three significant figures. But I'm not going to ask you that, okay? The ones that you are going to see are more like this. So how does this come into play? This comes into play when you multiply and divide numbers. When you multiply and divide numbers, your answers have to get rounded to the least number of significant figures in the problem. So if I have 8.63 times 0. 0, 1, 0, whatever this answer is, I'm going to have to round it to how many significant figures? How many significant figures in 8.63? Three. How many significant figures in 0. 0.010? Two. two. So whatever this is, I'm going to round this to two, dec to two significant figures, not two decimal places. So my answer in this would end up being 0 0.0863. So if you did the math, if you multiplied 8.63 times 0, 0.010, I would get 0 0.0863. Do you see that's three significant figures in that answer? That's too exact. It's like too precise. I have to round it to the smallest number of significant figures in the problem. So that means I'm going to keep the eight and the six. What happens to the three? It'll go away. So I'll have 0 0.086 as my answer. That only has two significant figures. Now, addition and subtraction doesn't matter about significant figures. Addition and subtraction, you round to the smallest number of decimal places they all have in common. So if I have like 8.31 and 0 0.543 and 1.2, and I have to add these, always do the math first. So I take 8.31, add 0 0.543, and then add 1.2. 
So I've got to add all of those numbers together. So this one would be a three. And this is a five. And that's a 10. And that's a 10, right? So I got 10.53. But which decimal place do they all have in common? So, so this is the tenths. That one goes to the hundreds. This one goes to the thousands. So do you see that that two the one, one decimal they all have in common. So that means that I'm going to have to round the five. What will that do? Round it up. So you'll end up with 10.1 as that answer. Same thing with subtraction. Do the math, then just round to the digits that the smallest decimal that they all have in common in your subtraction. So addition and subtraction, don't care about significant figures. But we do a lot more multiplication and division. So let's practice a few. Mm -hmm. So put these in your calculator. First, I want you to just write out, like write the whole answer. Okay? So go ahead and do the math. Write out the whole answer. Try not to take up too much, like all, that entire line. Leave. A so the numbers that I got on the board, I just went through and did the math. Just straight out. I didn't do any kind of rounding or anything like that. So in the first one, 0 0.120, how many significant figures in that number? Nope, 0 0.120. Yep. Mm -hmm. So everybody see three? Mm -hmm. All right, 2.782, how many? Four. Okay, so one has three, one has four, so my answer has to have three. So now I have 0 0.33384, so that's five significant figures. I've got to round, so just start from the left, underline the first three significant figures you get to, so the three, three, and three, then look at the next number. The next number's an eight, so what's that gonna do to my last three? Round it up, so 0 0.334. That makes sense? Okay. Second one, I got to do the same thing. So 12,500, how many significant figures? Three, because there's no decimal place. That's the one, two, and five. But 3.7 is two. So that means my answer can only have two. So starting from the left, the, again, two threes are my significant figures. Next number is a seven. So that's going to do what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is it, am I going to leave it 34? Look where my decimal is. One zero, two zeros. So do you see that that's 3,378? So I do end up rounding the three to a four, but I got to add those two zeros to show the size of the number. So now it's 3,400 rounded up. Now this one, addition and subtraction, what is the smallest decimal place in all three of those numbers? The two, right? Two decimals. So you see the first one, I have three decimals. Second one, I have two decimals. Third one, I have four decimals. So the one that they have in common, they all have two decimals in common. So I just come all the way over to the second decimal. It's a seven. The next number's a nine. So what do I got to do? Round it up. Everything else comes off. So four, seven, seven, point five, eight. Okay. This subtraction, 25.896, how many decimals in, in that one? Three. 15.7896 has how many decimals? Four. So three is my smallest. So this is going to determine how I round. So I just go to the third decimal place in my answer. The next number is a four. So what is it going to do? It just gets dropped off. Mm -hmm. So it ends up being 10.106. This one is division. So how many significant figures in 0 0.0045100? Nope. <laughs> how many? There's a decimal place. So the zeros at the end count, right? Mm -hmm. So this one has five. Come on. It has five. 0 0.0256 has three. Mm-hmm. Right? The zeros out front don't count, and so the 256 does. That means I got to round this to three. So this 
the one, seven, and the six stays the same. So zero point one seven six. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another multiplication. I ended up with twelve million five hundred and sixty thousand. What do I have to do? How many significant figures in the first number? Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Because there's a decimal. Mm -hmm. That decimal means all those numbers are exact. 12.56 is four. So I'm going to round my number to four. So here's the first four. All the rest are zero. So what do I do? Mm -hmm. Two, five, six. Is that it? I would be personally offended if I had $12,560,000 and they only give me $1,256. <laughs> what do I got to add? Add all those zeros. They're not significant, but they show you how big the number is. Mm -hmm. they gotta, they're they got not significant because there's no decimal at the end. There's no decimal in that number, but they show you how big the number is. And then the last one. So the last one I have to round to what? The nearest tenth. So see how 3.6 has one decimal, point one, one decimal. So that means this eight, what happens to the two? It just gets dropped off, right? So nine, nine, six, five, point eight. No zero? Mm -hmm. No, the, when it's adding and subtraction, you don't have to use significant figures. You just round to the, the decimal that they all have in common. Well, it might be wrong. <laughs> like that might end up being like, so if it, there's a question on a test, it might be like a multiple choice question. And so all the answers might be right, but the only one that really is right is the one with the right number of significant figures. So that is where you have to make sure that you like check. Check what the rules are when you do addition versus subtraction versus multiplication and division. So here is something that you will get to be able to prepare for an exam. You will have the opportunity to write whatever you want on one side of a four by six inch note card. I will give this to you next week. Because if I give it to you now, you'll just lose it. So I'll give it to you next week. But as you're starting to study chapter one stuff, if you find things like rules or examples that like help you remember something, start writing them down. Because I've had students write so small that I swear they put all their notes on one side. <laughs> I look at them, I'm like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> like they start off and write tiny. So start like making a list. Maybe you want to write down what those, what the prefixes mean, or maybe an example of a one step versus two step, or maybe you're having a hard time remembering certain elements and symbols. Okay. So those kinds of things, all that you can put on here. And so maybe about like multiplication and division rules, how do you round? Okay, versus addition and subtraction. So start kind of thinking about those things because you'll have this, you'll bring this with you for your first exam and you can use it, okay? You'll always have a periodic table, so do not bother writing anything about the periodic table on there, okay? You always have a periodic table and it's on the wall. But anything else that we've covered that you're like, I don't know how I'm gonna remember that, then start making a list of it because you'll find that that's gonna help immensely. Last thing and then we'll quit. So the last thing is called scientific notation. Scientific notation is just a way of shortening really big numbers, okay? So one really big number that we are going to talk about this semester is Avogadro's number, okay? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, okay? This is... Ten, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. That is how big that number is. Isn't it a number that never stops running? Like pi, the number pi, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Yep, so that's one, but that's, it's, it's 3.14, but then there's like, oh, like they've carried those digits out like 50, 50 places. But this is Avogadro's number. So this is actually one that we'll like talk about again. But do you see that if you had to keep track of all those zeros, that would be like craziness? So instead, they just shorten this. So scientific notation always puts your number between one and nine. So it just moves the decimal place until your number is a number between one and nine, and it only keeps significant figures in that part of the number. 
Then you have times 10 and the number of exponents is how many places I had to move my decimal. So here I put 602 and 21 zeros because it took 23 moving the decimal place to get my number between the six and the first zero. So that's where 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd is. So that's like the number of molecules in a mole. So we'll talk about that in chapter three. But if you're thinking about like the size, how much does like one atom of carbon weigh? 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 1. Right. <laughs> that's about how much an atom weighs. Mm -hmm. Super, super crazy soup super small. So if you were trying, huh? Yeah. So this, if I put this in exponents, it's just easier to manage. But when I go to exponents with this, which way my decimal place ends up having to go to the right, my number is less than one. But if I count, count all those, how many did you get? So I had to go 25. So this is one times 10 to the minus 25th grams. A negative exponent means your number is less than one. A positive exponent means the number is larger than one. And notice here, I only put the one. I didn't have to put 1.0, I just put the one because in all of that, only the one is a significant figure. Just like in Avogadro's number, only the 6.02 is significant. All the rest of those are just zeros. So you only keep the significant figures in your notation. So here's a couple to try. Yeah, because we've got like two and a half minutes. <laughs> so how are you going to do this one? Tell me what this is in scientific notation. Hmm? It's going to go to the left. How many? Nine. Nine. Mm -hmm. So it is going to be 10 to the ninth. Right, so my, if you don't see a decimal, then know your decimal's at the end, okay? So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's how I know it's times 10 to the ninth. It's a number bigger than one, so the exponent's a positive number. Now the only other thing you've gotta worry about is which of these digits do you put down in front? It would be one point two. Is that zero, next zero, is that significant? Yes, because mm -hmm. it's in between. What about the five? Yep, what about the six? Yep, and the eight? Yes, but those other zeros, there's no decimal place, so those other zeros all fall off. So you only show significant figures in that. So what about 12,500? Mm -hmm. So it's gonna end up being times 10 to the fourth because it's bigger than zero. Well, bigger than one, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. 1.25, no decimal place, so I'm just gonna keep 1.25, those two zeros get dropped off. Those ones are kind of helpful to put it in, in scientific notation. Sometimes it doesn't really make it easier because this one, all those are significant figures. So I have to keep them all. <laughs> like I can't dro just drop those ones off, but my decimal place would only move how many places? That 456, it would move three. The number always needs to be between one and nine. So it would the decimal place would move just two. It would just go one, two. So my answer would be 4.560025 times 10 to the second. So I always move the decimal place. No matter where it is, the decimal place gets moved so your number is between one and nine. And the only other numbers you keep are significant figures. Unfortunately, in that number, they're all significant figures, so I have to keep them all. How about this one? 0 0.0025896. Uh-huh. It's going to have to go which way? How many? Three. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go one, two, three. So this is times 10 to the negative three. Remember, if your number's less than one, then when you move the exponent, it's gonna be a negative exponent. And so what would my answer be? Mm -hmm. Yep, 2.5896. Those zeros out front, they're not significant, so they drop off. So this is where you can really see those zeros out front disappear. Zeros at the end disappear if there's no decimal place to begin with. 
So you tell me these last two. Write these ones out in regular form. 1.123 times 10 to the 12th. What would it be if you wrote it in regular form? What would you put? You would have nine zeros. So you can think what I always do is go like, okay, well, my decimal's here and I got to go 12 places. And since it's a positive, so the 12 places are going to go to the right. My number's going to get bigger. So I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Each of those little humps is a zero. Mm -hmm. So 1, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Nine zeros. What about that one? Which way is it going to go? To the left. How many? Okay, so I'm going to end up with zero point one, two, three, four, five, nine, five, two, one, two, three. Decimal place would go six places to the left because it's a negative exponent. Okay, so if you're in lab tonight, we're going to do this. We've only got in chapter one, we've really now only got to talk about density, talk about percent, and then we're going to move on into chapter two. So we should be able to finish that up on Monday and then get into chapter two partway through. Practice these, okay? Practice those unit conversions, practice the balancing equations. If you get stuck on one, just like send me an email, take a screenshot, send me an email. I don't understand how I to solve this one. I will tell you in the balancing equations, there's two or three that are pretty hard. Like they're not simple to do. You can, they're all balanceable, <laughs> but some of them are a little more difficult. We're pretty much on the exam is going to be very similar to the ones we've been talking about. They're not going to be like extremely complicated, but practicing is the way that you're going to get more and more familiar with it. Okay. Thank you. All right, and I am saving this, and I will post this. So if you ever want to go back and look at those marked up PowerPoints, you always have that as an option. If we fix lab, what, what happens?